powerful, convicting passage of Scripture. I'd like to read it together, if you would. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, Behold, we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will life and and will he not repay man according to his work? Sometimes we say that we really don't know what's going on but we kind of do and this passage just kind of calls me us up short the question isn't do we know what's going on the question is will we do something about it will we do anything about it Dr. Lawrence White told of a, a recent trip that he made to Germany with his two sons to a small town of Oranienburg where Heimlich Himmler, one of the men responsible for the Holocaust, chose as the site of his prototype concentration camp called Sachsenhausen. This was from a message he preached based on that experience. He's talking about his two sons, and he says, The boys grew quiet as we walked across the vast expanse where the barracks once stood, which held hundreds of thousands of prisoners during the 12 years of the Hitler Reich. We saw the bales of human hair, the piles of children's shoes. We went to the medical laboratories where gruesome experiments were conducted on living human beings without anesthetic. Because they were not viewed as human because of their race, their language. Finally, we walked to the back, far in the corner, to the crematorium that once stood, where where the crematorium once stood, the oven where they burned the bodies of the dead. Out in front of that grotesque wrought, uh, was a, of that, uh, of it was, excuse me, a grotesque wrought iron statue of two emaciated inmates holding the dead body of one of their cohorts toward the gaping doors of the oven. The building itself had actually collapsed. They buried so many people underneath it that the foundations had been undermined. But the metal supports that once held the ovens were still there. As we came up from there, three days after Christmas, in front of the doorway of the crematorium, there was a withered Christmas wreath with a white ribbon on it. The slogan on that ribbon said, From the Christians of Germany, We kneel before God in bitter regret and humble repentance. And we ask his forgiveness for the Jews and all the others who died in this place. This is not how I planned to preach this message on what it means to love God with all your heart. But as I've read about and watched the news, as many of you have as well, the recent laws that have been been signed or passed in New York and Virginia, my heart was broken, and I knew I had to speak up. First Baptist Church of Golden has been called by God to be a force for good in Golden and beyond. I think it's good for us to remember what it means to be good. What is good? Life is good. Life is a gift from God. All life matters. Black lives matter. Blue lives matter. White, Asian, Muslim, Polish, West African, British lives matter. All lives matter. The infirmed, the marginalized, the wealthy, the poor, Democrat, Independent, Republican. All lives matter. LGBTQ plus lives matter. Because life is a gift that we all share in common, given to us by our loving, gracious, magnanimous creator, whether we acknowledge him or not. 
And it seems strange to say it, but we have to say it in the 21st century, especially in America. Babies' lives matter. Dr. White finished his talk with these words. The Christians of Germany learned all too late that the people of God cannot disengage from the culture in which they live. We cannot withdraw to the comfortable security of our beautiful sanctuaries and sit in our padded pews while the world all around us goes to hell. For to do so is a betrayal of the Lord whose name we bear, and it's a denial of the power, the efficacy of his word, the word that he has given us to proclaim. There was a um, German pastor named Martin Niemöller. I have heard these words read before. I've even used them in a sermon before. But he really brings home a significant point that I think every single one of us must consider. They're probably familiar to you as well. He said, First they came for the socialists. And I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. And I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. And I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. What does that poem do to you? How does it make you feel? I've read this before. I've pondered it before. I've ruminated on it before. This time, something stood out to me that I had really never paid attention to. The question that kept reverberating in my mind was, who are they? Who are, who are they? I think they are us. They are me. And they are you. Except for the grace of God. They are us. They are you. They are me. If we continue to stand by and do nothing. So the question I think we have to ask ourselves. Is what is God moving us to do? Now I want to pause there for just a second I am not going to ask us to decide what we will do I am going to ask each and every one of us to ask God to tell us what he wants me to do what he wants us to do what will we do around this very inflammatory, volatile, and difficult issue of abortion. Not just late-term abortion. That's what's brought it to the forefront. But what will we do about abortion? What does it look like to be disciples of Jesus so that we can be a force for good and golden and beyond? I mean, that's what we... We believe God's called us to be a force for good in golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. So what should that look like when it comes to critical social issues? How does God want us to be involved? What is God moving you to do? We can't do everything, but we can do something. I can't do everything. But I can do something. And the sermon is a start. You can't do everything, but you can do something. One of our church members, who the snow kept him away this morning, I see, Tom Harmon, told me months ago that he was torn up about abortion. And he, he, was, he was upset. He was like all of us. We have an opinion about abortion, but... Are we involved? He came to me a couple months ago and he said, you know, I'm, I'm tired of complaining. 
I'm going to do something about it. And he has gone and gotten himself training in the Alternatives Pregnancy Center so that he can counsel men. Because oftentimes we think of the, the women who were impacted by this, this decision. But there are men involved as well. And both men and women need counseling post-abortion as well. And Tom wanted to be able to provide that for the men. The question I think we have to ask is not just what is God moving you to do, but what will we do? What will you do? Last Saturday, with only three weeks' notice, 3,000 people gathered for a day of mourning. They met at the convention center in Albany, New York. Now, that is significant because the convention center is underneath the state house where Governor Cuomo signed the New York bill into law that legalized killing babies after they had been born or infanticide. They not only passed that law, but they celebrated. They changed the colors to pink outside the building. 3,000 people gathered there. 35,000 additional people joined them by live, spring, live stream to mourn and repent over the sin of abortion. One thing we can all do is pray. And not just pray about the situation, but pray and ask God, what do you want me to do about this, God? I think the people who organized the day of mourning and those who gathered in Albany, New York had it right when they said, our prayer has to start with our repentance. In Joel chapter 2 and verse 12, we read, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. God is saying whatever is going on in your world, whatever is going on in your life, even though you may feel and sense and know that you deserve God, my judgment, if you will repent, if you will rip your heart open and allow me to take out of there what's, what's been hiding in there, what you've been nursing, what's been festering, I will relent and heal and not bring the judgment that you so richly deserve. God said, I'm not looking for an outward show. The Jews were, were very familiar with this very tactile, graphic illustration. Whenever something bothered them profoundly, a financial loss, the loss of a loved one, the loss of a battle, they would, they would rip their, their clothes and they'd put dust and ashes on their heads to let everybody know that they were grieved by this thing. God's saying, that's not what I'm looking for. I don't want outward show. What I want is a broken heart. And that brokenness is the foundation through, from which God can accomplish much in this world. As we look to God and we say, I am wrong. And we receive his forgiveness. Turn from your sin and turn to God. That is repentance. Bring all of you to God holding nothing back. And that is loving God with your whole heart. That's what this is about. When we say we love God with our whole heart... The heart is not about the emotions. There are emotions involved, but the heart is really the seat of all decision-making. It's, it's the place of your will. And as we choose to follow God, to obey Him, then our feelings will line up with that. And that feeling that we look for with love will come out of that. But it begins with a choice of me saying, God, you have everything of me, all of me. To love God with your heart is to love Him with integrity. It means that you're the same with God in private as you are with God in public. That's what he's talking about. To rend your heart. 
To love God with all your heart is to love with the totality of your inner self. To love with complete integrity, to hold nothing back. Repent, he's saying, with a very real and sincere change of heart. As soon as the New York bill was signed into law, an act that I think is probably one of the ways this particular legislator was rending his heart, Nebraska Senator Ben Sasse sponsored a bill called the Born Alive Survivors Protection Act. And in this bill, it was going to require a health care practitioner to exercise the same degree of professional skill, care, and diligence to preserve the life and health of a child, any child, born alive at the same gestational age. That bill never made it out of committee. They used a, a process procedural vote called cloture. And in that procedural vote, even though many more people might vote for it, if you don't have a certain amount of votes, then it can't pass out of committee. They have to have 60 votes. So the bill was voted down, even though 53 of the voting members voted in favor of it. 44 of the senators voting, voted against it. And so it didn't pass. Now, some of the talking points of, of those who voted down the Born Alive Abortion Survivor Protection Act, whichever side of the political aisle somebody's on, should really grieve our hearts and give us reason to pause. You have the typical response. This was one legislator said it's part of the war on women's health. Another senator made a valid point when she said that the measure puts Congress in the middle of important medical decisions that, that patients and doctors should make together and without political interference. I think most would agree that the government has no place in this sort of thing. The problem is, nine years ago, the government got involved and took it over. And laws like the one that were passed in New York are the very reason we need to do things like this. To me, that feels dis disingenuous. And this is the comment that, that made me pause. And maybe it will you as well. One senator claimed that this bill would force doctors to, and, and here's the quote, provide care that is unnecessary or even harmful to patients. Really? Caring for a, a newly born baby is harmful? I, I don't get it. The backlash against these sort of extreme legislative measures seem to indicate that this may be waking up the conscience of America. I pray that it is. This was information taken from the, the Marist poll. These are people who poll. They're, they're very concerned about abortion issues, and they poll to see the support um, for or against abortion. The Marist poll shows that 9% of Americans who identified as pro-choice a month ago have switched and now declare themselves pro-life after Governor Andrew Cuomo led the New York legislature to pass the most liberal abortion law in America and Virginia Governor Ralph Notham declared his support for a bill legalizing infanticide for babies who survive abortion. A full 80% of Americans pro-life and pro-choice believe abortion should be limited to the first trimester. You get that? A full 80% of Americans, whether they're pro-choice or pro-life, believe that abortion should be saved for the first trimester. Now, I'm not saying that's okay. I also think abortion shouldn't happen at all. But 80% but of the people who are both for and against say, this is not right. Post-birth abortion is infanticide, and it's wrong. Another summary of those results. After just releasing their annual numbers last month, the people behind the Marist survey decided to re-poll Americans to see if opinions had changed in the brief four-week span. And boy, have they. In January, 55% of Americans called themselves pro-choice compared to 38% who identified as pro-life, a 17-point gap today. The number of Americans who call themselves pro-life and pro-choice is dead even at 47%. Just how significant is that? 
This is the first time in history of the Marist poll, abortion poll that as many Americans have identified pro-life as pro-choice. And this was a quote of one of the pollsters. This has been a measure that has been so stable over time. To see that kind of change was surprising and the increasing discussion of late-term abortion in the public forum in the past months appears to have made, have made the biggest difference. I'm concerned with the conscience of America, and I'm encouraged that, it's, that it's, it seems to be maybe potentially waking up. But to be honest with you, I'm not most concerned with the conscience of America. I'm concerned with the conscience of First Baptist Church Golden. I can't do a lot about America but I can do something in my local place as an individual, and so can you. And then we can do something together about America. A force for good in golden and beyond by being disciple of Jesus. My response, and I think our response, should not be begin with moral outrage. I do not believe that we have the moral high ground. People on the other side of this issue are not the enemy. They have been duped by the enemy. They have been given the same gift of life to enjoy. Their creator loves them as much as he loves us. Our response should be one of love for them because they have been fooled and imagine what it will be like for them when they realize what they've done. We should hit our knees on behalf of them, asking for God to reach them with his love and for them to see what this issue is truly all about so that he does not have to bring judgment that this sort of sinful disregard for human life warrants. Our response should also be a response of brokenness and sorrow. Brokenness over the roughly 60 million babies who have been aborted since 1973. Brokenness for the millions of men and women who have been through the trauma of abortion. My voice today is not the voice of accusation. It's not the voice of judgment. I don't have any room to do that. If you're here and you have been touched by abortion, You've had an abortion. You know someone who's, who's had an abortion. You, you're impacted by it. Every single one of us is impacted by it. I want you to know that First Baptist Church of Golden is not going to be a place of judgment and condemnation. It's a place of compassion and love. And yet we have to do something. We have to come face to face with this issues. See, we've all made choices of which we are ashamed. Choices that went against God's plan and design for our lives. Choices that impacted others. Maybe the moral outrage should be directed inward at our inactivity. God is not unaware of the human heart's penchant for sin. He stands ready to forgive, to cleanse, to heal, and restore. When we, when we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow, as Garrett reminded us earlier. Though they're red like crimson, they shall become like wool. You see, we have to speak the truth about abortion and not, not try to, to be careful with our words in one sense because we don't want for those who have been through it or are considering it or have been impacted by it to not realize how serious it is. But we also cannot say there's forgiveness unless we first understand that, that there's brokenness. Brokenness because we chose to sin. 
Our response should not just be a prayerful response asking God what he wants us to do, not just to love those duped by the enemy and those caught up in whatever sinful practice, and not just a response of brokenness and sorrow, but also a response of boldness. A boldness that emerges out of the brokenness. The only way we can do this without judgment, with compassion and love, is to let our own foundation be our brokenness. And then we stand boldly for what we know is true and what we know is right. The time to shrink back and wring our hands is past. Shaking our heads at the degradation as we retreat to the comfort of our homes and our personal diversions will not do. The time to step up and be a force for good to live out our discipleship is now. And together we will discern God's mind regarding what he wants us to do. We will not stand by and do nothing. We need to stand up. I don't know what it ought to look like for you. And to be honest with you, <clears throat> I didn't come with a plan of what it would look like for us as a congregation. But I, I want to rehearse just the main things we've said. And I want to lay out a challenge or two for us to consider as we draw this to a close. To stand up means, first of all, pray for God to break your heart over what breaks his heart regarding abortion. Pray for God to break your heart over what breaks his heart regarding abortion. I know, even though our numbers are way down because of the snow, even in a group this size, we have folks from all different perspectives on abortion. That would be my suspicion. And, and I have to say, I, I want to apologize. You had to sit and just hear me spout what I believe. And my, my, my prayer is not that you, you felt it as a baseball bat, but as a loving, compassionate challenge to consider. Pray that God, not Len, not First Baptist Church, that God would break your heart over what breaks his heart regarding abortion. My opinion is no more significant than yours. But God's opinion, we would be foolish to disregard. Pray for God to break your heart over what breaks his regarding abortion. Second, Invite God to move you to action. Invite God to move you to action. You've prayed over what, what, what breaks God's heart. You've asked him to help you have your heart broken and then invite him to move you to action. I want to I wanna just take a couple minutes right now, right where you are, and I want you to take some time you can close your eyes, you can keep your eyes open, you can stand up, you can lay down, I don't care what you want to do, but I want to invite you, before we go any further, to talk to God about this. Ask God to break your heart over what breaks your heart, his heart over regarding abortion, and invite him to move you to action. So let's just say, take some time between us and God before we continue on.
mercy you have withheld your wrath from our nation. But we know that just as President Abraham Lincoln declared regarding the institution of slavery, every drop of blood drawn from the lash shall be paid by another drawn from the sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. We know that neither shall the shedding of the innocent blood of 60 million babies in America go unrequited. Forgive us, O God. We plead for mercy and ask that you awaken and stir the American church to arise and fight for the lives of our children and for the soul of our nation using every spiritual gift and political tool you've graciously given us to stop this hellish curse while there is any time. Awaken your leaders in every mountain of culture to use their power and influence to turn this evil tide. Amen. There's a third thing that you can do. And I personally um, am looking forward to this. Um, I'll let you see it for yourself. Johnson is in the other room. Here. Our first order of business is to present Planned Parenthood's Employee of the Year Award. Abby Johnson. This is Abby. She's our newest volunteer escort. Abby, this is Cheryl Alessandro. I'd be the youngest director in Planned Parenthood history. You'll actually be in charge of the abortions at your clinic? I have a chance to make a real difference. No matter what you do for the rest of your life, you're still going to be a baby killer. The only thing that's changed is you, Abby. Can you even hear yourself talk right now about these procedures? These are little babies. I'm not going to apologize for doing a job that helps women in crisis. There's still a part of me that isn't sure. I know. But the one thing that all experts agree on is that at this stage, the fetus can't feel anything. Sorry to bother you, but they need an extra person in the back room. Are you free? I saw it. And it was like it was twisting and fighting for its life. We commend the souls of these hundreds of children. And Lord, we pray to end abortion. I really appreciate what you've done for us. I'll not forget it. 22,000 abortions. How do they even comprehend that? Rough day at the office. You can say that. You're making a mess. to be a perfect instrument of corporate policy. We are an abortion provider. I can't be part of this anymore. Everything that they told us is a lie. Don't underestimate the repercussions of this. You gotta be careful. Rhonda, please don't do this! Rhonda! Let me tell you what's gonna happen if you walk through that door. Congratulations. You have made an enemy of one of the most powerful organizations on the planet. going to go to that movie together and um, I would love to know if anyone is interested in going with us um, the contact card that's in the pew in front of you would be a way you could respond to any of this if you're saying you know what I, I, I'm willing right now I'm not all I don't know what God wants for me actually I'm not even all that broken up about it that's okay it's where you are there's no judgment for you either put that down on the card. We'll pray together. You don't know what God wants you to do, how he wants you to move into action, but you're willing to pray for that. Write it down. If you know what he wants you to do, write that down. If you want to go to that movie with us, just write the word unplanned down. Love to have you join us. Um, to me, it won't just, and it won't just be an evening of popcorn and movie. Um, we'll set it up so that we can have discussion afterwards and talk about it and pray about it because I suspect God will continue moving. Fourth thing, 
seek God's mind on his next steps to live out our discipleship as a force for good. We want God's mind on this. Months ago, elders all went on a retreat, and uh, the agenda started off like normal. Saturday morning, Pastor Rick Messer led us in a devotional that just changed the whole day. We spent the rest of that day seeking God's face based on Luke 11, 11 to 13. That passage says, If your son were to ask you for a fish, you wouldn't give him a snake. If your daughter asked you for an egg, you wouldn't scare her with a spider. How much more will your Father in Heaven, who's a better parent than any of us could ever hope to be, give us the Holy Spirit when we ask Him? We're asking God to, to, to lead this church. It's His. And we're asking God to lead this church in this issue, in this area. I believe that God wants us to stand up for life. I believe that God wants every single one of us here to stand up for life. You're here for a reason. Because you had lots of reasons not to be here. If you're here and you're like, you know what, I, I don't buy this at all. Please, come to the movie. Let's talk about it. Let's be real about it. Let's, uh, maybe, maybe there's something I'm not considering. But don't just walk away and never come back. Don't just walk away being hurt and angry and upset. Let's talk. Come now, let's reason together. Father, I am so grateful that you are compassionate and you are good and you are loving. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for giving us the gift of free will where we can choose to do things that you do not want for us, that you know are not best for us. And when we realize it, we can come to you and you will forgive. Father, we ask you to give us wisdom and insight to know how to stand up for life as an individual and as a church.